tonight we've got uh, Dem 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 Slideshow who's come along. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, come along to give us a talk on uh, paper money, which uh, he considers to be rather a sham, I think. <laughs> paper money, the, monetary, the, pa the paper monetary fallacy. So, uh, if I may hand it over to you, Dem Dem okay. Uh, yeah, thanks very much, uh, David. Uh, before I give you a bit of a sort of an introduction of myself and tell you a bit about my background, uh, maybe I should first establish the topic of my uh, talk this evening. Um, I will talk about a book that I've been working on, uh, and the working title is uh, The Paper Money Fallacy, uh, The Errors of Elastic Money in the Coming Monetary Breakdown. Um, so it's a book about paper money or paper money systems and um, I think the, the book has two goals in a way. I mean the first goal is to provide what I would call a conceptual analysis of paper money systems, you know the fundamentals of paper money or the economics of a paper money system. Um, and the conclusions here are that uh, well, paper money systems are first of all not inevitable, you know, they're not needed, they're not a natural outcome of a growing economy. Um, well, secondly, they, they actually have no advantages. Uh, you know, we are being told that paper money systems are, have many advantages over you know, commodity money systems. Uh, I think all these advantages will, um, on close inspection, turn out to be illusionary. Uh, but the most important point is that uh, paper money systems are inherently unstable. Uh, and uh, you know, if you look at them conceptually, you see that they cannot be made to be stable. Uh, over time, paper money systems will uh, add um, imbalances to the economy that ultimately will lead to you know, economic disintegration and chaos. And that's why ultimately you know, paper money systems will fail. Uh, that also applies to our present monetary system. Obviously, we, we live in a paper money system again. Uh, the present paper money system is, in, in fact, uh, you know, fairly, fairly young. It's not even that old. Um, obviously, through most of the 20th century, you know, we had uh, you know, paper money systems in one shape or form. Um, although after the Second World War, um, obviously, the, the US dollar became the global reserve currency. Uh, and, and it was used by central banks around the world as a reserve currency. And for central banks, uh, the dollar was still exchangeable into gold until 1971. So um, that changed obviously in December 1971 when President Nixon took the dollar off gold internationally. And since then, uh, the entire world is on a paper money standard. Um, and, and in fact, that's the first time in human history that sort of the entire world is, is on, on a pure paper money standard. Most governments have their own little you know, local currencies and, and central banks and can theoretically produce as much money as they like. So this system will also end, and it, it most likely will end badly. Uh, and that sounds like a, like a dramatic statement, but I think if you look into history, you will see that uh, you know, history confirms this so far. Um, paper money systems have been tried on and off uh, in various places and various civilizations for the last 1,000 years. Uh, not one of these systems has survived. Uh, they're all collapsed. They're all ended in failure. Um, and they always end in two ways. I mean, either they end by the monetary dislocations becoming so big that the monetary authorities voluntarily abandon paper money and return to some form of commodity anchor. That's one option. Or the other option is they don't do this in time and, uh, you know, the currency disintegrates and you get high inflation and ultimately you get uh, economic uh, chaos and societal disintegration. So these are, historically, these have been the only two outcomes that we know, and uh, I, I quite fear that, you know, so there's going to be a more unpleasant outcome for the present system as well. So, so that's sort of, uh, obviously history can only tell us what, what happened and not what must happen, so in order to assess our present system, we have to analyze it conceptually, and that's sort of my goal with this book. The second goal, which is a bit secondary to the first one, but I think it's still important, uh, is the idea uh, that our present system may actually be close to its end game. I mean, the end game may be fast approaching for the present system. And I think in this, this uh, context, I think the recent crisis that started in uh, 2007 mm -hmm. is actually an important step uh, in that development. Um, I think this crisis can only be properly understood if you put it in the context of a paper money system and how paper money systems dis ultimately disintegrate. So uh, the prediction, if you like, I make at the end of the book is that, uh, you know, we may have a major currency catastrophe on our hands, you know, pretty soon. 
Uh, well, let me tell you a little bit about my background. Uh, I, before I started writing this book, I, I worked in the city. I uh, worked in financial markets uh, you know, for almost 20 years. Uh, my last job in the city was a, as a senior portfolio manager for a big U.S. Uh, investment management company that specializes in uh, fixed income investments. Uh, so I was a portfolio manager and I managed uh, the bond portfolios of institutional clients uh, around the world. Um, a year ago, I decided to resign from that position and devote myself completely to writing this book. Now, the ideas for the book had been sort of, you know, growing in my head for quite some time. Um, and I think you will not be surprised that if I tell you that I owe a huge intellectual debt to the Austrian School of Economics. I mean, those of you who are familiar with uh, Austrian School Economics uh, will not be surprised about this. Um, I've been reading Austrian economics for sort of the last uh, 20 years. Um, I uh, obtained a degree in economics in my home country in Germany, but as most students of economics at university, you get education in what I would call mainstream economics. You know, it's, it's Keynesianism, neoclassical school, monetarism. Um, but uh, you get very little exposure to uh, the Austrian school of economics. Uh, but I, I got a little bit of that at university, and that got me hooked. And uh, you know, through the 20 years, almost 20 years that I was in financial markets, I kept reading about it. First of all, mainly as sort of sort of uh, intellectual interest, you know, out of cu curiosity. I mean, the Austrian school is a very interesting school of thought in terms of its sort of philosophical background and methodology. Uh, but uh, what's, what's interesting about the Austrian school also, it has a lot to say about money. And in many ways, its contributions to uh, uh, you know, monetary theory are extremely powerful. So over the years, I realized sort of how penetrating the Austrian analysis was actually for what I was experiencing every day in my work life in financial markets. But in a way, I was even more surprised to find out how little you know, people paid attention to the Austrian school. And uh, if you work in financial markets, you will realize that almost the entire discussion is dominated by those traditional you know, standard strands of economic thought that became dominant in the 20th century. As I said, Keynesianism, a bit of neoclassical school, a um, bit of monetarism. Uh, monetarism. But sometimes you find a few U.S. supply siders, but very, very few Austrians. Um, and uh, so I think uh, over time, sort of this, yeah, I experienced this tension, you know, between on the one hand seeing the Austrian anal analysis, which would, you know, not cast a good light on, on our present financial system, and at the same time I saw really no uh, appreciation of these Austrian insights uh, uh, in financial markets, and certainly you don't see it in policy uh, circles in the policy establishment. Now, anyway, the whole thing came in a way to a head in the recent crisis. And uh, uh, not only was the crisis a very you know, sort of uh, shocking and devastating event to go through, but um, uh, for someone with my background, I felt that um, it was even more shocking to see the policy response because it appears like we are policymakers try again to stick to the old policy tools of just you know trying in a crisis to print ever more money and, and force feed the, the economy and the system with ever more freshly printed money and or run larger deficits, which is basically the standard response that we had for the last you know 30 years and which has actually got us into this mess. So the amazing thing was sort of what, what was really caused these problems is supposed now in the larger doses to uh, get us out of these problems, uh, which I think is not only uh, entirely absurd, uh, it also raises the question what the end game of this whole uh, charade is going to be. And uh, so I figured I need to step out of, the, out of this business and, and reassess it from the outside. And, and the result is obviously the book that I've, 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 uh, I've written. I, uh, I used the term paper money a couple of times, so let me just be very clear what I'm, what I'm speaking about here, because um, now obviously today we live in a paper money system, but most money today isn't even paper anymore. I mean, most money uh, in circulation today is electronic money, it's basically just bits on a hard drive and a computer, it's, it's uh, immaterial money, it even, doesn't even exist in the form of paper. But the, the key point for me is the one of elasticity of supply, and that is really sort of the distinguishing factor. If you have a pure commodity money system, like a gold standard, you know, whatever the commodity is, it means that the supply of money for society is essentially fixed. It's static. 
Now, obviously, it's not entirely fixed because if the commodity is gold or silver, you can mine it and mint it and get it into circulation. But uh, this involves expenses and it's, it takes time and, and it's, it's, it, does, it can't be done quickly. I mean, there is no institution or person in the commodity money standard that quickly can expand the supply of money to the economy or society. And that is the distinguishing factor to a paper money system. And this is why you know, states introduce paper money systems and that's why we are told that these are superior because here there is a, a, a money producer or a group of money producers who enjoy the privilege of pr creating this money and creating paper money is essentially costless and creating uh, electronic money is definitely costless uh, so they can create limitless money. I mean there is no limit you know, to the money they can create. Uh, so the the idea obviously behind it is that you know by uh, flexibly adjusting the supply of money to the society, you know we can avoid economic problems or have a better functioning economy. Um, I need to stress this point as well because as as, as I already <coughs> told you, my my conclusion will be that elastic money systems don't work. Uh, but so ultimately at some stage we will have to go back to a commodity money system, to some sort of commodity anchor. Um, uh, uh, the only question to me is whether we first go through a massive crisis and then go back to commodity money, and this has been the, the fate of some paper money systems before, or if we voluntarily abandon paper money before we have a big crisis and, and go back to commodity money in time, which has also been done many times before. So, so it's either of these two things. Now, I, I need to make sure that, you know, sometimes if you say this, people think that it means we all have to go back to walking around with a little sacks of gold coins or silver coins to make payments. This is absolutely not the case. You know, even on a proper gold standard, you can use your credit card or you can pay a bill on the internet or you can use a, a wire transfer because this is just payment technology. These are just techniques by which we transfer the ownership of money. It has nothing to do with the fundamental questions you know, what is the constitution of the monetary system and what determines the supply of money. So, so, so this is the key distinguishing factor, is whether money is, is, is limited in supply and fairly inflexible in, in supply or whether it's ele uh, fully elastic as in the paper money system. Now, the, uh, uh, I think most people don't have a problem with the paper money system for one reason, because they think, well, we live in a growing economy. You know, an economy produces more goods and services, so there are more transactions, so we need more money to facilitate more transactions. So it, it seems almost like a, 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 an elastic money uh, constitution is, is the, the logical outcome of a growing economy. And this is simply wrong. This is, is completely untenable. And, and the simple reason is that money is a medium of exchange. And it's in the very nature of a medium of exchange that any quantity of it is sufficient, you know, within reasonable limit. Any quantity of the monetary asset can facilitate any number of transactions and can meet any demand for money. Because the demand you have for money is driven by its purchasing power, you know, by the, its exchange value for goods <coughs> and services. And if you in, adjust the purchasing power of money or the, 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 the price of money, if you like, of the monetary asset, you know, any demand for money can be met. Uh, maybe I explain this a little bit, uh, you know, with an example. I think I think we all can see this. You know, we're all money users, so we can all ask ourselves, you know, what is our demand for money? And um, well, the first question is, in a way, you know, why why would we have any demand for money? Because uh, you know, why would any of us hold some of our wealth in the form of money? Uh, you know, money doesn't. It's not a consumption good. It does not fulfill any of your needs. Uh, uh, it's not an investment good, it doesn't get you any returns by which you then buy more consumption goods in the future. Uh, uh, there are opportunity costs involved in holding money. So why do we hold money? Well, the, 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 the simple answer is because we want to have the flexibility of being ready to engage in transactions spontaneously. You know, money is the most fungible good that we can hold it can most quickly turn into a transaction. And that's why we have demand for money. And it's really only because we live in a world of uncertainty and unpredictability that you know, we hold some of our wealth in, in its most liquid form, in the form of money. And that determines the demand for money. But here you can see right away that you know, the, 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 uh, what, what you really demand if you demand money is not a physical you know, uh, substance and, uh, you know, that doesn't do anything for you. You want exchange value. You want spending power in its most 
easily accessible form. That is the demand for money. And that demand can be met by changing the purchasing power of money. So if you want to hold more money, let's say you want to hold more, whether it's in a, in a, in a, in a gold standard, in it's gold coins, or in a paper money standard, and it's paper notes, if you want to hold more money, you want to have more money spending power. And that can be met in two ways. Either someone produces extra gold coins or extra paper and gives it to you, or prices drop, the purchasing power of money goes up, and therefore the money that you already hold buys more. And there, that way, your demand for your increasing demand for money is being met. And this happens in an economy automatically. Because if you imagine that in a, in a, in a commodity money society, where the, the supply of money is fixed, let's imagine everybody wants to hold more money. I mean, it just simply means people uh, uh, you know, sell goods and, and accumulate more money, but nobody produces more money. So what happens is the prices of goods and services fall, the price of money goes up, or the purchasing power of money goes up, and that way supply and demand are again perfectly in line. And I think this is an important factor, I mean, it's such a fundamental point about money, but I think it's important to understand, and that's the reason why you know, money can be an, a, a commodity that's completely inflexible in its supply. I mean, you know, mankind has used money for two and a half thousand years, and for most of that history, it was an, an, an unchanging commodity, and people voluntarily you know, chose gold and silver, and sometimes copper, um, as a medium of exchange. So the demand for money can be met by changes in the purchasing power, and that happens very naturally by people buying and selling. And obviously the reverse is true if people were, uh, had a lower demand of money for, for money, they would get rid of their money balances, they would spend the money, and if everybody does that, prices go up, the purchasing power of money goes down, and again, supply and demand are in line. That's a unique feature of money as a medium of exchange, because you only demand it because it has exchange value. It doesn't have use value, it only has exchange value. If people have more demand for shoes, and if people have more demand for mobile phones, someone has to produce shoes or mobile phones. If people have more demand for money, nobody has to produce more money, because it's being adjusted by the purchasing power of the monetary unit. I, um, at this stage, I should, I should probably say one thing, because you know, if, if, if you imagine in a society that grows, so that produces steadily more uh, goods and services, uh, but has a, an inflexible supply of money, it obviously means that over time prices decline. You know, you have what we call deflation. Now, I have to say that, uh, I mean, this would be moderate secular deflation, which is uh, common for commodity money systems. Uh, now, this is, uh, it's, it's a bit unfortunate that today in the financial press and, uh, you know, in, in statements from central bankers, you get the impression that sort of deflation will be the end of the world. I mean, this is some sort of you know, massive disaster that we have to avoid at all cost. And this is complete nonsense. You know, this, this is uh, commodity money systems had, you know, ongoing secular deflation for, for, for uh, hundreds of years, and it was absolutely no problem. Um, uh, obviously, I think when people speak about deflation or the risk of deflation today, they uh, portray it in such a bad light because it's now seen as a, uh, as a symptom of an economic recession. But, but that's a very different phenomenon here. What we are talking about is simply the, the moderate trend by which prices decline in a commodity money world where, where society gets more productive. If you look, for example, at the United States, uh, you know, the, the US joined the gold standard, joined Britain in the gold standard in 1879, and between 1879 and about 1897, um, prices declined in the United States on average by about a percent uh, every every year. I mean, you had a fixed supply, pretty much fixed supply of money, and a growing economy, prices declined. Uh, during this period, there was uh, a, a immense economic progress, uh, you know, immense accumulation of wealth and rise in living standards. You know, the, the, the deflation was absolutely no problem. Um, now, what I just said about the, um, uh, the, the money having exchange value and not use value, and therefore supply and demand being regulated by the purchasing power, there's obviously a flip side to that. And that is, if you do have a money producer, if, if somebody should manage to get himself into that position where he can issue paper tickets and have them accepted as money, as a medium of exchange, once that happened, this money producer can produce as much money as he likes. 
You know, there's, in, in, in contrast to any other producer in the society, he never runs the risk of any of his produce, you know, accumulating in his warehouse because he can't get rid of it. I mean, it can't happen. Because if, if, the, if the purchasing power adjusts supply and demand, that is also the case if we have an extra supply shock. So previously we said the, the, the demand for money rises, but the supply for money is fixed. You know, and that is being adjusted by a rising purchasing power of the monetary unit, where now you have the demand for money fixed, but the supply goes up, and that means the purchasing power of the monetary unit has to decline. You have inflation. So once money is accepted, or paper money is accepted as a medium of exchange, the money producer can produce as much of it as he likes. Now, obviously, often people say, well, but what if people don't trust their money anymore, and they try to get rid of it, and, and, and they try to reduce their money holdings because they fear inflation? It is true that at the at extreme levels of inflation, there is that point where people maybe want to disengage from the medium of exchange. But that is a very costly procedure. I mean, you have to realize how important money is as a medium of exchange, and a developed economy just needs money. And in, in the honest truth is what happens is even in a, in a high inflation society, you know, people deal with a higher inflation. And in fact, you know, more money, more physically produced uh, monetary assets can be placed with the public at a constantly declining uh, purchasing power of the monetary <clears throat> unit. You know, if the, if the, if the uh, money producer injects more money into the economy, although the money is not demanded, it only means that the purchasing power of the monetary unit goes down, prices rise on trend, and that money will be placed. Uh, now, obviously, the money producer can only place the money at, an, at a marginal decline in sort of a return, but he's producing at almost zero cost, so that's not really an issue for him. And that that is the case is, is actually sometimes readily admitted by the central bankers themselves. Um, I mean, I have one quote here from Ben Bernanke, uh, the, uh, now the chairman of the US Federal Reserve, one of the biggest paper money producers in the world. Uh, now, he gave that speech in 2002. Uh, at the time, he was already on the board of governors of the US Fed, uh, but he wasn't the chairman yet. Uh, and he, he said the following in a speech, and I quote, he said, the U.S. government has a technology called a printing press, or today it's electronic equivalent, that allows it to produce as many U.S. dollars as it wishes at essentially no cost. We conclude that under a paper money system, a determined government can always generate higher spending and hence positive inflation. Now, in, in fairness to Mr. Benanka, we should say he, gave, he made that comment when he gave a speech about how he could fight the evil forces of deflation, and uh, so he was speaking about a specific context, but uh, we have to remember that the Fed does not in, uh, expand the money supply just at times of crisis or in recessions or now in the, in the, in the present um, uh, situation. Um, in fact, you know, since the Fed was founded in 1913, they have con continuously you know, expanded the supply of money. But the important point for me in that statement is, which is factually absolutely a correct statement, is that, you know, nowhere in that sentence is money demand, you know, because it's, it is, the money producer can produce money regardless of demand for it. Um, you know, there's nowhere is any consideration, you know, how much money the public would want. If the U.S. government wants, they can produce more money. And that's by definition, the situation that any paper money producer is in, uh, uh, he can produce profitably money without any consideration for, for money demand. And uh, if you look a little bit in sort of about, about, about the history of, of our paper money system over the last hundred years, I mean, or let, uh, most of the data I use here is from the US, but I think similar things would happen if you look at the data in the UK to some degree even more so because for the last hundred years inflation was uh, considerably higher in the UK than in the, in the United States. But if you look in, uh, I just use US data here for, as, as an example for my presentation. If you look at the last 50 years, so the last half century, uh, over the last 50 years, uh, industrial production in the United States has grown by a factor of five. So, you know, industrial production has grown fivefold. The supply of money has grown by a factor of 25 or 26, depending on what measure you use. If you use uh, currency in circulation, it has uh, grown by a factor of about 26. 26 times. Um, and if you use the money supply M2, which is the Fed's you know, standard measure of money supply, it has grown by a factor of, of roughly 25. 
so uh, well, all this money was produced. I mean, certainly not because the economy needed it. I mean, that, that we've already sort of explained that, that that is not the case. Now, you can say, well, was there growing demand for money? Now, in fact, if you look at the statistics, there was probably growing demand for money. But this supply, this flood of money, far outstripped the demand by the public uh, uh, for more money. And you can see that simply by the decline in money's purchasing power. As we said, all this money can be placed by just allowing the purchasing money to, uh, uh, power to go down. Uh, in fact, over these 50 years, uh, the, uh, the one, every US dollar has lost 86% uh, of its purchasing power. So today, uh, a dollar buys about 14% of what it bought you in 1960. And, and it's, it's only by you know, sort of, uh, lowering the purchasing power of the monetary unit so much that all this money could be placed with the, with the, with the, with the public. I think this is very important to appreciate because I do think that most people feel that because uh, your money is being uh, uh, injected into the economy via the banking industry and a part of the lending business, that the growth in money is sort of a response to market forces. It's sort of because we have demand for money or we need this money to uh, uh, you know, sort of grease the wheels of, of, of business. Uh, and that is not the case. You know, this money is not demanded, it's not needed, but the money producers can inject it. You know, if the U.S. Central Bank had wanted to inject twice that much money, they could have injected twice that much money. If they had wanted to inject half the money, it was half the money. It's, it's, it's not driven by market forces. So I think the important point to realize is the extent of money creation is not the result of economic conditions, but economic conditions are the result of money injections. You know, the, 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 the shape of our economy the relative prices, uh, relative incomes, income distribution, you know, the relative importance of various business sectors is driven by this massive inflow of money. I mean, all this money going through the economy changes lots of things. It doesn't just change the inflation rate. It affects the economy in many, many ways. So it's not, uh, money creation is not the outcome of economic conditions. Economic conditions are the result of money creation. Now, one of the arguments that we hear why uh, a paper money system is superior is obviously that we are told that, you know, by, by cleverly managing the supply of money, the central bank can deliver a medium of exchange that is stable in terms of its purchasing power. You know, that has, you know, so we have price level stability. Obviously, in a commodity money world, nobody manages the supply of gold or silver, uh, but in a paper money system, the central bank can have an inflation target and, 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 and go for stability. Now, I think, uh, that this argument is nonsense is already clear from the data I've just shown you. I mean, you, so much money has been produced and is being produced regardless of demand and, and, the, and the, the purchasing power of money has declined so much um, that it's almost, you know, absurd to assume that if we have a paper money system, we get more stable money. Historically, exactly the opposite was the case. Yeah. I mean, the dollar and the pound sterling are the two oldest currencies in use today. And uh, the only reason why they existed for such a long period of time is because for most of that history, they've been tied to gold or silver. Now, on various occasions, they were actually taken off gold or silver, usually when the government needed money, and usually there was during times of war. Uh, William Pitt took uh, the, the, uh, the pound of gold in 1797 uh, when he, you know, for, the, for the war against France. From 1797 to 1821, the Bank of England didn't have to... Uh, uh, you know, pay banknotes in specie and therefore could you know, fund the government more easily by printing more money. So we were on a paper money standard in the UK during this period. And inevitably, we had inflation. And in 1821, they went back to a gold standard and, and inflation stopped. Uh, the Americans took the dollar off the gold standard in, uh, of their, their, their own gold standard uh, during the Civil War. To, to fund the Civil War, and they actually left it on a paper standard after the, after the uh, Civil War. And again, this was a period of, uh, at that point, unprecedented inflation. Um, so if you look at the historic record, I mean, to even suggest that, you know, we need uh, paper money for price level stability is almost, you know, absurd. It's, it's, it's entirely nonsense. So I think, I think we can forget this argument. I think in the book, I go through some of the uh, conceptual arguments for price level stability and some of the practical problems with trying to establish it. Uh, so there's a whole chapter about this in the book, but yeah, you know, I, I, I won't I won't bore you with this now. But um, I think I think this is one of the points we can we can uh, put aside fairly quickly. So why was all this money produced, and, and why is constantly being more money injected into the economy? 
And, and I, think, I think the short answer is because those in charge of the money franchise think that it's good for us. You know, they, I mean, it, it sounds a bit like a facetious answer, but, but I think it's clearly not driven by money demand. So it, the idea is that if we inject money into the economy, paper money into the economy, we can stimulate the economy or we, we can get more growth. In particular, um, uh, because the uh, extra money creation allows banks to lend more uh, and allows banks to engage in what is called, you know, fractional reserve banking. Um, uh, I, I need to say a few things about fractional reserve banking, and again, there's a huge literature about it. I, 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 I go into it in more detail, again, in, the, in, in, my, in my book, but um, I think I can say at this stage, I, I need to just explain briefly the mechanics of it. Now, obviously, if, if you think about um, uh, a paper money system as now, and if you have physical money, I mean, that means you have notes in your, in your pocket, and you put that into a current account at a bank, um, you still consider yourself to be the owner of money. I mean, because, you know, it doesn't really make a difference whether you have the money in your pocket or it's, it sits, you know, in a current account or a side deposit or demand deposit at a bank. You can pull out the money at any time. You can even put it, pull it out at, a, at an ATM, at a cash point. Um, so you're still an owner of money. And it's almost like the, the bank has just took, took the money from you and just kept it in, a, in, in the vault, which is obviously not what they do. And to be fair to them, they don't even pretend that that is what they do, what, because we all know what they do. They keep a little reserve, and the rest of the money they lend to somebody else. But that means that other person now also thinks they own money. You know, and they do, because they, they're, also, uh, they're being told by the bank that you, they also own money now, the money that they get in form of a loan from the bank. So suddenly, on the same amount of deposited money, two claims exist. And statistically, the supply of money has already gone up. In fact, I, I mentioned earlier the money supply M2 in the United States. You know, this would go up by the transaction I just described. You know, there's now more money in the system. And um, if you look at the money supply in the United States, it's right now M2 is about 8.7 trillion US dollars. Uh, by the way, half of that was created in just the last 10 years. Uh, uh, 8.7 trillion dollars. Of that, about 800 billion is cash in circulation, 700 billion is money market funds, and the rest is balance sheet items in the bank. It's basically just, you know, book entries in the bank where the bank says, yeah, you own money and you can get it, you know, any day. Obviously, you can't because there's only a small reserve that the bank keeps to pay out those people who uh, would who, who demand to be, uh, you know, repaid. Uh, I should say also another thing about uh, the person who takes out the loan from the bank, because we have to be very clear, the person who takes out the loan from the bank does not have demand for money. Uh, people often confuse this and think, oh, that's, that's money demand. It's not money demand, because the person who takes out a loan, uh, I mean, doesn't take out the loan to you know, sit on the money and keep the money in cash. I mean, I, I cannot exclude that sometimes people may do this, but it, it's very, very rarely the case. People who take out loans have demand for goods and services. In fact, they have such urgent demand for goods and services that they're willing to incur the interest cost of getting hold of these goods and services right away. So they don't have demand for money. They take out the loan in form of money, spend the money right away to buy the goods. So the money is being circulated and, and uh, gets into the system, and other people end, hold, end up holding these you know, money claims. I'm just stressing this here because we have to understand that this process of money creation via fractional reserve banking is not linked to money demand. You know, it's not like there's more money demand so the banks can lend more. This is nonsense. You know, the banks lend more because they can entice more loan business by, by, by creating this deposit money. And the banks are not even really restrained in this, uh, confined in this activity by any independent loan demand either. Because to the extent that they can lower their reserve ratio and create more deposit money, they can lower interest rates and therefore offer more loans in the market. And under normal economic conditions, lower interest rates mean higher loan demand. So they generate this loan demand and the money gets into the system and we've already seen uh, you know, any amount of money can practically be placed. So to the extent that banks manage to lower their reserve ratios and become, they become money producers, and to the extent that they become money producers, the same things apply to them that we said earlier about paper money producers. You're not confined by any lack of money demand. You can place it. Um, now, obviously, it's very clear that this is a kind of dangerous operation for banks to, to, to do because, you know, if, if too many people show up and demand their money back, then obviously there is a bank run and the bank runs out of funds. And, um, and in fact, today, 
all banks are practically fractional reserve banks. So if enough people line up outside a bank branch, you know, you can shut down any bank. It's, 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 uh, it's, it's just in the nature of the business. Um, now, fractional reserve banking, in a way, is about sort of 300 years old, and it was obviously practiced under gold standard conditions as well. Um, and um, uh, it, it, the history of fractional reserve banking was obviously also the history of, you know, occasional bank runs or financial panics and also boom and bust. Now, what's interesting is that this whole business has attracted then the attention of some of the economists, uh, probably sort of about 150 years ago, which uh, began to uh, uh, analyze the effect that fractional reserve banking has on the broader economy. And, uh, and the idea, because the, the, the suspicion was that, uh, you know, creating extra loans, not based on savings, but creating extra loans based on printing money, could potentially have destabilizing effects for the economy. And it was one of those things that already uh, was discussed extensively by the British classical economists in the middle of the 19th century, uh, uh, although they did not sort of develop this into a full theory. It was then left to the Austrian school of economics, and particularly Ludwig von Mises, who in, in his book on, on money and credit from 1912, was the first to lay the foundation of what became known as the Austrian theory of the business cycle. And the idea here is that you know, the practice of fractional reserve banking, the artificial lowering of interest rates through money creation that the banks can do, and therefore the extra credit in the system that this generates leads to economic dislocations. Now, again, I, I, I will not and I cannot go uh, into the entire um, you know, Austrian theory here, but it, just to give you the essence of it, um, well, if you think about credit, you know, an expanding credit will lead to more investment. Now, expanding credit can have two sources. Either it's individual savings, people save more money and redirect income from consumption to investment, or more credit can be the result of money creation and therefore, uh, you know, fractional reserve banking and money, yeah, money creation. Now, the initial uh, effects that these two things have on the economy are, in fact, identical. Uh, the initial effects on the capital structure are very, very, very similar. You know, obviously at lower interest rates, many investment projects by entrepreneurs that were previously unattractive now become profitable. Entrepreneurs take out more loans to realize these investment projects. There's extra investment going on, extra capital creation uh, that makes the economy more productive. You know, it's, it sounds really good. And it is really good in the early phases, it's really good. But the Austrians were showing that this, uh, this investment activity is ultimately unsustainable if it's based on printing money and is only sustainable if it's based on savings. So the outcome in the long term are very, very different in, in, in these two approaches. And the reason for that is simply that if you know, credit is based on saving, it means that somebody has voluntarily redirected resources from consumption to investment. The consumers have cut back on consumption, made resources available for investment. And so when the entrepreneurs take out the extra loans and realize their projects, they have the resources, the resources are there to um, uh, realize their projects. Well, if it's based on money creation, you know, nobody has changed their spending patterns, nobody has changed their saving, nobody has changed their consumption plans. Indeed, the consumers have not freed up any resources on the economy and allowed them to be redirected to investment. So what you have is you have investment that exceeds voluntary savings. Now we all know savings and investment have to go hand in hand. That doesn't happen if you have money creation, you can artificially lower interest rates. Interest rates are supposed to coordinate investment and saving. They don't do that anymore if you create money and inject money into the economy. So the Austrians were showing that if this happens for a while, you get a, an investment boom for a while. As the new money gets into the economy, it looks really good, it feels great, you have an investment boom, people still consume. But after a while, the banks will realize that they're running out of reserves, they become a little bit more cautious. Uh, the flow of new money ebbs a little bit and, 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 and declines. And, and then suddenly, you know, the preference of the consumers reassert themselves. They try to bid resources away from the uh, entrepreneurs. And many of the investment projects that were started in the boom cannot be seen through to their conclusion, have to be abandoned, and you go into recession. And the Austrians were very clear about, you know, once the recession starts, there's nothing you can do about it. You know, if you want to avoid this, this was what the Austrians said, if, if you want to avoid this, 
you you have to avoid them this money this artificial boom that you create by money money uh, money creation you know the, if, if if you if you if you uh, uh, stick with the gold standard and even ban fractional reserve banking or make fractional reserve banking more difficult that way you know you don't have these artificial you know money induced booms uh, in a way, I think, as I said before, the British classical economists had some um, influence on policy uh, that the Austrians, unfortunately, did not have. Uh, so, uh, you know, many people like to quote the uh, 1844 Bank Act in the UK, uh, in Britain, which, which was uh, um, uh, partially sort of based on the insights of the classical economists. Now, the, the, the Bank Act, or Peel Act, as it was called, banned the issuance of banknotes by private banks. And uh, part of the idea behind that was to uh, make fractional reserve banking more difficult. Uh, now, I have to say that you know the Bank Act had some sinister side effects in that it established the Bank of England as the monopoly provider of paper money even more. So I'm not quite sure if, if all the intentions were, uh, were realized. Uh, and obviously, then banks began to issue deposit money. So today, it's, it's not a problem for banks at all to uh, to conduct fractional reserve banking, that they cannot issue banknotes anymore. So, um, uh, uh, but but the Austrians, as I said, had basically no influence with their with their with their ideas. And what happened is actually quite quite uh, the 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 opposite of what should have been done, uh, because the from the late 19th century on, many governments began to actively support fractional reserve banking. You know, not to curtail it or limit it, or even just to leave it to the market. I mean, you can imagine in a free market, you would assume that banks would be very careful about lowering their reserve ratios too much, uh, because you know there's nobody there to back them up. Uh, but uh, what what obviously gained hold in the early part of the 20th century was the idea of the central bank as the lender of last resort. So the idea with the banks wanted to have a backstop, a government backstop for the lending activity, and that was basically established in the early part of the 20th century. And I think the change is most meaningful in the in the United States, where uh, uh, you know then in 1913, on uh, on by demand from Wall Street banks, you know the Federal Reserve was started uh, specifically as a pro as a lender of last resort to Wall Street. So the idea was not to restrict fractional reserve banking, but to actively you know encourage it. Uh, and if, if you look at some of the effects that had, uh, they're actually quite interesting. Uh, I mentioned before, in 1879, after the Civil War uh, and, and the, the period of paper money in the, in, the, in the U.S. around the Civil War, in 1879, the U.S. went back on a gold standard and joined Britain on, the, on what became known as the classical gold standard. Um, in 1879, um, every American, on average, every American had $2 in a bank deposit uh, for every dollar in, in physical gold. So you know, one dollar in physical gold and two dollars in bank deposits. That was the ratio. By 1929, in 1929, obviously the, the year of the crash, uh, every American had on average 12 US dollars in bank deposits for every one dollar in specie. So you can see the idea that the banks had a lend of last resort, they had a backstop from the government, they could now lower their reserve ratios much more, engage in more fractional reserve banking. And yes, I think the, the you know, we, we are being told that this is good for the, for, for the economy in a way where well, it was good for a while because it created this massive boom that ultimately had to end uh, in, a, in a catastrophe. <coughs> and again, the Austrians, at that point, one would think that maybe the people would start listening to the Austrians a little bit more because they had actually uh, foreseen this disaster and explained it before it even happened, but uh, obviously the Austrians weren't very popular in the crisis because you know once the damage is done, there was very little obviously that could be done at that stage. The message was to stop this money creation, uh, uh, this credit extension by money creation, um, and and uh, well obviously. Um, Obviously, it's clear that uh, that throughout the 20th century now, all the changes that were made to the financial infrastructure and that you know the the infrastructure that we live with today is basically designed to encourage you know credit extension and money creation by banks. Um, uh, if, if you think about the steps that were taken after the Great Depression or during the Great Depression, President Roosevelt took uh, the dollar off gold domestically in 1933. Uh, he did that in a rather draconian way by uh, uh, executive order. He uh, uh, confiscated all privately held gold in the United States, uh, sealed all bank uh, safe deposits of Americans, 
uh, and they had to hand in all their their, their gold holdings. Uh, I mean, I think they were paid about twenty dollars per ounce. Um, uh, but um, uh, it's interesting that these restrictions for the American public to own gold as an investment asset uh, actually continued to 1974. Only since 1974 uh, are Americans free again to invest in gold for like personal investment uh, purposes. Um, now, and obviously, I already mentioned President Nixon took the dollar you know, off gold internationally in 1971. So, but since 1971, now we have, you know, a, as I said, a global paper money system. And the design of the system is to encourage the expansion of credit. So, um, uh, I come back to the earlier question. You know, I think we've seen that a paper money system is not needed, it's not necessary, it's not necessary for, for a growing economy. Whenever somebody produces paper money, he can produce as much as he or she likes. And um, uh, it's, it's, it's very clear that, that in this current system that we have, you know, the idea behind the system is that more credit is good for the economy. It means more growth, more investment. And the insight from the Austrian school or from the British classical economists that there is a huge difference whether credit and investment is backed by savings or by money creation, this insight is completely ignored, and it's completely ignored to the present day. It plays absolutely no role in the construction of our financial infrastructure. And uh, what uh, uh, also remember that um, uh, you know, when people speak about this cycle theory, the Austrian uh, business cycle, um, I think this word cycle is, is probably not even appropriate anymore. Uh, in the, in the, during a gold standard, it was clear that there could be a credit expansion if banks lowered their reserve ratios. Sooner or later, they, they run into trouble, and then there is a contraction, and the economy goes into recession. And in a gold standard, there is nobody there to provide the banks with extra reserves to shorten the recession, to stop the recession, or to try to kickstart another credit boom. So under a gold standard, the recession was allowed to cleanse the system completely from any misallocations, or almost completely. Uh, this is not the case really in a paper money system. What we've seen was, since the Second World War, in particular since the 1970s, is that we, uh, the central banks allow credit creation, allow the banks to create. This generates the same dislocations and misallocations of capital that the Austrians have explained and that occurred under a gold standard, gold standard conditions or in the 1920s. But now when the economy rolls over, the central banks comes in and prints more money. You know, reserve, your reserves used to be gold and gold was inflexible and nobody could create it at will where now the central banks can create as much money as they like, and they step in and extend the credit cycle. And in fact, I think the idea that our monetary system has proven to be so stable is a huge misconception, because what we don't realize is since the 1970s, almost every recession has been artificially shortened by another dose of money, by lowering rates again, pushing more money into the system. So all that means is that the dislocations are now massively larger than they ever were before, and they certainly would be under a commodity money system. Uh, because when now the economy rolls over because of the accumulated uh, misallocations of capital, you know, the cleansing recession is not allowed to unfold. Interest rates are being lowered by the central banks, you know, it's active monetary policy, uh, and, 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 this, and, and this, the system is allowed to expand again. So over time, more dis uh, misallocations will accumulate, and the system gets progressively more unbalanced. Now, you can see this very well if you just look over the last sort of, um, um, uh, the last sort of 12 years, from 98 till the start of the, you know, this financial crisis. Um, in 98, uh, the, the US Fed had a tightening bias, so it was ready to hike interest rates again because they were concerned about the boom in equities and uh, the, the, the liquidity in the financial system. Um, uh, then LTCM occurred, this hedge fund went under, and Russia defaulted, and so the Fed cut interest rates in order to encourage you know, further expansion uh, and, and, and stop the system from deleveraging. Uh, in 99, the Fed injected money towards the fourth quarter of 1999 because they were concerned about the Y2K effect on computers. That was a massive inflow of money, which again pushed the equity market further out. 2000, the equity market turned. In, in 2001, the, the Nasdaq bubble burst. In 2001, we had a US recession, a very shallow one. Uh, the Fed went down to 1% interest rates, kept interest rates at 1% for three years to re-stimulate the economy. Now, the effects that this had on the, on the, on the broader economy you know, is, is, are, are not surprising. If you look at bank balance sheets, you know, from 1997 
2007, so the 10 years before the financial crisis, bank balance sheets in the United States have doubled, more than doubled, from $4.7 trillion to $10.2 trillion. I already mentioned that in the last 10 years, M2 has practically doubled from you know, about $4.5 trillion to now $8.7 trillion. Um, uh, from 1990 to 2009, uh, U.S. mortgage debt quadrupled from $2.5 trillion to uh, $10 trillion. And from 1996 to 2006, so within 10 years, the uh, inflation-adjusted prices of U.S. houses uh, grew three times more than in the previous 100 years. So uh, the, the dislocations are massive, and, and they're, they're inevitable in a system that constantly injects money. And, and as we've seen, you know, there is basically no... Um, uh, no limit to how much money can be injected in the system. I think the ultimate limit will be that banks have, will have such a small capital base uh, and, and look so shaky that they will basically stop uh, uh, expanding, that we, we come to an end of the fractional reserve banking process. And I think this is basically what happened uh, in this crisis in 2007 that we're still living with. Now, so what is the end game? Uh, Ludwig von Mises uh, wrote in 1949, he said uh, the following, he said, uh, and again I quote, there is no means of avoiding the final collapse of a boom brought about by credit expansion. The alternative is only whether the crisis should come sooner as the result of a voluntary abandonment of further credit expansion or later as a final and total catastrophe of the currency system involved. And here's the point where I come now to this uh, sort of uh, um, projection, sort of my forecast, that I think from all I can see right now in the financial industry, what I can see in terms of policy, the policy establishment and the, and the views in the, in the press and the media, uh, I think unfortunately the policymaker is going for the second uh, uh, solution, which is to try to expand this process ever more. Now, they already lost the banks because the banks, you know, even at zero interest rates, even with getting reserve money for free from the central banks, they're unwilling or unable to expand anymore. The, uh, the bad assets that have accumulated on their balance sheets are just too big. You know, they, 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 they are afraid of going under. Uh, and although many of these b banks have been bailed out already or, or get funds from the government or you know, some institutions like Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac in the United States have basically been taken over by the government, um, uh, uh, many of these banks are obviously still concerned about, you know, uh, bankruptcy and, and they're just not able to expand anymore. So what we see now in this phase is that obviously the two entities that now step up uh, uh, are the central bank itself, you know, the ba central bank balance sheet is expanding. Um, uh, in the two years since, um, since Lehman collapsed, uh, the U.S. Fed produced $1.1 trillion in reserve money and gave it to the U.S. banks. Uh, that means the Fed within two years created more money than it created from its founding in 1913 up to the collapse of Lehman Brothers in 2007. Um, uh, they gave all this, this, this money to the banking system, um, basically, and they're paying them interest on it uh, so that they don't spend it. Uh, they, they, they gave it to the banking system and basically it's, it's just money so that they don't sell their assets, you know, that the banks can fund their bad assets at, at very low interest rates and get you know, all this liquidity from the, from the Fed in order, because if, if it weren't for these $1 trillion, the banks would be forced to liquidate more of their assets and, and, and trim their balance sheets. And that is feared to have knock-on effects on the broader economy. So, so this is why this policy was enacted. So what we're seeing right now is, uh, is, is not an unfolding of the crisis. You know, the system is basically in a state of arrested collapse. You know, without these trillions of dollars from the Fed and the bailouts by the government, you know, the system would begin to shrink. You know, the inherent uh, desire of the system is to delever. You know, to, to, is, is, the, the credit structure is completely blown out of proportions. It's not in line with the available pool of voluntary savings. It's blown up because of credit creation. The system has a desire to uh, uh, deleverage and, and to, to, to shrink in size, but it's not allowed to do that. Uh, yeah, and, and, and all that policy is doing right now is try to avoid the shrinking. And, and I think the point I, I'd, I'd make here is simply that uh, this, this, this is not an end game. This cannot be the end game of the system because right now, obviously, this doesn't generate growth. Uh, uh, in, in fact, if, if the system would be left to its own devices, it would certainly shrink. We would get deflation. Certainly, many asset prices would go down considerably from where they are now. Uh, billions of uh, mortgage debt 
uh, are being artificially <coughs> propped up by quantitative easing and guarantees from the government. Uh, we don't even know what the prices are if you know the, the, these assets would have to be supported by voluntary savings. Uh, but uh, you know, the market is not allowed to reveal this because you know these developments are basically uh, frozen and uh, and uh, the, the the systems artificially propped up to not reveal the extent of the decisions and not allow them to cleanse. Um, so. Uh, what is the current assessment? I think the way I see things right now is uh, the, the Fed this year so far has not continued to expand its balance sheet. They have basically stuck at about the $2 trillion mark. But uh, in the current environment with a, with a very weak economy, obviously the, the government is spending way too much money. You know, we have this massive uh, budget deficits piling up and there's no end in sight to that as well. Uh, these budget deficits will ultimately have to be funded by the central bank as well because, you know, again, the, 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 the pool of private savings is so much more limited. Somebody has to step up and buy this. Uh, already, the, U, uh, the U.S. Fed is already the third largest holder of U.S. Treasuries after uh, the Chinese Central Bank and the Japanese Central Bank. Uh, right now, the Fed holds more than $800 billion of government debt. Uh, and I can assure you that the way things are going, they will have to underwrite more of government spending via the printing press. I mean, in, 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 in effect, they're already doing this, and they will have to do more of it. So right now, we are in this sort of... Un state of what I call arrested collapse, you know, where, where things are not allowed to really deteriorate, but they're not really pumped up with new li liquidity either. But, uh, uh, you know, so which way are we going in terms of the Mises assessment? Either do we allow uh, these dislocations to cleanse and, and do we take the pain of, of seeing this adjustment? And that means probably, you know, banks go under, uh, pension funds go under, insurance companies may be in trouble. and. Uh, uh, the government will have to stop spending money, uh, or will the policymakers go for the other option and try to buy the system another round by again pushing aggressively more money into the system? Uh, but then I think the outcome will ultimately that they tear down the entire paper money system, and this has historically been the uh, the end game for any paper money system. I think there will be a point in which the markets realize that uh, uh, the, you know, the banks, the government. Uh, and many other entities are just simply artificially kept alive by an ever by, by zero interest rates and by, by an ongoing provision of, of ever more new money. Um, and this is obviously not an end game. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much Is there any questions or comments? Uh, Oliver? Uh, Daniel. Oh, that was excellent. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, does anybody else understand this in the city? Do politicians really understand this uh, process? Uh, you worked for 20 years. Did you come across anyone else who sort of really understood Austrian economics and realised it was a... Uh, no, I think, I, think, I, think very, I think very few people do. And um, I have not come across anybody. I mean, there are a few, and I will name them in a minute. But uh, uh, I, I have to say no. I think I, think I was... Um, uh, working in the city for a long time, you realize how, to what extent, you know, very intelligent people can work in an environment in which they just work with a certain paradigm that they've been given and that they see other people use, and that is sort of almost self-reinforcing. You know, they, they, if, 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 they, if, they, if you talk about, uh, for example, money creation uh, and, and the ex massive expansion of money by the Fed, uh, you know, they're, they're almost uh, Pavlovian reflexes, and people say, oh, that means inflation. You know, money, the, the problem with money creation is inflation. But then they look, there's no inflation right now, so that's not a problem. You know, so, so I mean, it's, it, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but it has become such a standard uh, view to see the problem with money expansion and money creation only in inflation. And if there is no inflation, there is no problem with money creation. This is almost, that's almost the paradigm that people work with. And, all, and these people have very extensive um, intelligent and informed discussions about you know, when the Fed will do QE2 and when they will change this and when they do use these tools. But the, the, the problem that this creates in terms of capital allocation or relative prices uh, is not being perceived. And I have to say, since I stepped out of the business and looked at it from the outside, it, it seems almost even more unbelievable to me how few people you know, realize this. And I think one thing I may add as well is if you work in, 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 in the financial industry as I did and if you have a position of some responsibility, there's also another aspect 
that almost on a human level you just don't want to see things objectively. You know, yeah, I, I can honestly tell from personal experience during the crisis there were moments when I knew the Austrians were right and this was going to be a complete disaster. But sometimes you just almost didn't want to believe it because you knew it would, you know, hurt your company, you knew your your co-workers, you know, everybody was depressed, you know, you hurt your clients. You almost wish that somehow the system would run another year or another two years. So I, I also think that uh, uh, sometimes your surroundings can force you to not see things really objectively. Uh, to your question, are there any Austrians? Very few. Uh, I think one of the most impressive uh, uh, analysts of the situation to me is, is, is a gentleman in the States. His name is Doug Casey. He has a very extensive uh, uh, research you know, company. And he's also a very, very uh, often a speaker. Some of his speeches you can get on YouTube and see him on the on the internet. And uh, he has a research service. Uh, uh, he's very, very, very bar bearish on things. And he um, he, he understands also in economics. And uh, uh, he is. Uh, uh, I think he would be one of them. There are, there are a few others, but 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 most don't. So you were in denial for a while, but they're not in denial. They really don't understand it. They really don't. Uh, well, I, th I think it's not. I, say, I think some, for, for some, they, they, they are in denial. Some don't understand it. Uh, yeah, I was maybe in denial for a while, although, uh, um, yeah, no, I think for a while I was probably in denial. But, but you know, th th there was that moment when you just felt like I knew intellectually, you know, this was untenable, and that's why I had to step out. I mean, I, uh, yeah. Okay. Did you see it? Detlef, thank you very much. It was uh, impressive and uh, I learned a lot. And um, I, could you go back on uh, what you said about the difference between quantitative easing, say, that is, uh, you know, new money, new money injected into the economy, and savings? Because the people who save are not the people necessarily who will be consuming later on. So it's not necessarily deferred consumption. People who reach a certain age, for instance, will simply save and you know, keep that money in uh, investments, but will not consume. What it is not for 20 years before they pass on that money to, their, to the next generation. So when you say that, for instance, there is a contraction, natural contraction and, and, uh, and so on, and uh, the uh, return on investment is very low, then people take their money out of savings and because it doesn't return much and then start buying things. Does it really work like this or did I not understand the logic, the mechanics between savings and future consumption? Uh, to explain the cycle. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm just I need to think uh, because obviously I don't want to just go into a big uh, sort of economic lecture that would take half an hour. So I try to give a short answer. Um, well, I mean, in a way, I think uh, consumption is really sort of the goal of of, of everything we do. You know, and and I, that's why I do think. Uh, 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 people are unduly scared of savings, and unfortunately, it's, it's been an unfortunately res unfortunate result of all the uh, of, of some of the uh, macroeconomic theories that have become popular. Is that sort of savings is a bad thing because saving means not spending and therefore hurts the economy, which is obviously nonsense because what you save is also being spent. I mean, if 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 if, if I uh, 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 save it means uh, some of my income doesn't go into present consumption but I set it aside for future consumption I still want to consume it and maybe if I don't want to consume it maybe I want to hand it over to my children to consume for them to consume it but it, 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 the, the end goal is still uh, consumption it just means your so saving means that I uh, uh, what I lower is the, the 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 present demand for consumption goods and and I set assets aside uh, resources aside for future consumption, and and we need to distinguish, you know, the 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 money flow a little bit with the resources because what, what people do if what people do if they're safe, they're basically redirecting resources. You know, real resources are being saved. I mean, it, it works via money because money is the medium of exchange. But ultimately, if people begin to save they're redirecting resources, real resources, from meeting present consumption needs to meeting future consumption needs. Mm -hmm. and, and these resources, for the time that they're not consumed, they're ready for some future consumption, they can be taken by other people <coughs> to create the uh, uh, um, investment goods and the capital goods and build up the capital structure to deliver those 
uh, 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 consumption goods of the future that will then be consumed. So, you know, in a, in a way, I, I really think that in essence, this this is sort of how how that how that cycle that that cycle works, and that's I, I think is also why um, uh, interest rates are so essential, because uh, what interest rates ultimately communicate to everybody in the society is the time preference of the public, and what that basically means is like how urgent. Uh, 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 is is the, the the meeting present consumption needs? How urgent is that compared to meeting future consumption needs? You know, interest rates tell us how uh, the value of future goods. You know, if you discount them to today, I mean, what is what is the present value of a future good? If interest rates are high, the present value of a future good is low, and vice versa. But that means if interest rates are high, you know, a good in the future is worth very little today. And, and this tells you that the demand for present goods is very, very high. And that's why, I mean, it, 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 if, if societies are poor, you know, poor societies tend to have high interest rates because simply, you know, the resources that are available are urgently needed for the present population to uh, you know, feed them and, and provide them shelter. Now, in theory, you could say, you know, if, if you believe in, our, in, in this monetary system I just explained, uh, uh, well, it's great if they had a bit more investment in these poor countries, and uh, so so let's let's put a central bank there, print money, lower interest rates, and there will be investment. But you see, what that investment does is you lower interest rates, and then interest rates wrongly <coughs> indicate that uh, time preference is very low, that people could do without present goods and would be happy to receive something nicer in the future. Mm. And suddenly you build out you know, uh, a capital structure to deliver you know, better products and more products in the future when the population needs urgently products now. So low interest rates and more credit in itself is not a good thing or a bad thing. It needs to reflect the, the, the demands of the population. And I think that is the point about uh, uh, an elastic money system. An elastic money system, in particular the system we have today, it's specifically designed for the central bank or the government. It sounds like a conspiracy theory, but that, that is really what it is. It's designed to help lower interest rates so we can have a bit more credit and the economy can, can, can go. But if they do this, they're distorting one of the most important price relationships in, in, in economics, which is the relationship between present goods and future goods, which is interest rates, and 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 thereby there mu this must lead to a misallocation of capital. It's it's unavoidable. John, given that you are in possession of various true and important theories, uh, and you are in a position to exploit these theories, presumably there was nothing to stop you doing so and cleaning up. Uh, make a lot of money as a consequence. And if that wasn't the case, for instance, with foreign exchange, uh, many countries, governments do produce statistics on their money supplies that are not wholly inaccurate. And you can look at these things and see you know, who's producing how much and uh, that could affect how you trade or with foreign exchange. So if you didn't clean up financially, why didn't you? Why, okay, why, why didn't I or why I'm not why, going so to? Not, why, I, I, that's not a question of your motivation. I mean, yeah, yeah. what stops you? There's an assumption there. No, I would say I think I think it's a yeah I think I think it's a good question. It's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a good question. I but I think I think one of the problems you will find in uh, you know it's, it's it's one thing to understand you know what must happen. It's another thing to get the timing of what happens right. And, and it, I'm not saying, but I think they're, they're two very different skills, you know, so I'm saying because I'm telling you something must happen, it, it, it's not necessarily imminent, right? And, and I think if, if I look back, uh, uh, I think the Austrian analysis is, is, it completely explains uh, what we've seen in financial markets. Um, uh, but uh, ob obviously, you know, when this will happen or and, and what shape or form it will happen is a different question. I'll give you one example. I think in 1971, when Nixon took the dollar off uh, gold, uh, we had the inflationary 1970s. And I think with the Austrian analysis or the analysis that I presented, you could have probably uh, um, uh, uh, speculated. On, on the fact that the system could end right there. I mean, it could, could be a crisis right there, or maybe the, the government would have to return to a gold standard. Actually, they didn't do this, because in 1979, Volcker took over at the Fed, and he did uh, something extraordinary at the time. He aggressively hiked interest rates, 
And basically, this was the last time U.S. authorities allowed this to happen. He basically you know, stopped, uh, put his foot on the brakes, uh, put the economy through a severe recession, and that, in a way, cleansed the system. Well, after that, they quickly allowed your money to expand again. Uh, no, I'm just saying this as an example where you think uh, the, the, that this happened doesn't invalidate the analysis I'm giving you here. I think the invalidation uh, is still correct. But it has so happened that they bought the system another 20 years. Now, in these 20 years, again, they expanded the system. Now, I personally thought in 2002, uh, when uh, after the collapse of the Nasdaq bubble and then the Fed went to 1% interest rates for three years, now, at the time, I felt they couldn't restart this credit growth again. So I was, I, I was not optimistic on economic recovery, and I was actually bearish in 2002, based on the analysis I gave you here. Now, this was wrong. You know? So I think the analysis is still right, and, and because I think all the fundamental explanations I gave for what goes on in the economy is still correct. But what happened is the, the Fed was so aggressive, again, in pushing money in and allowing uh, uh, you know, keeping rates at 1% for three years. And it did work in the sense that it caused the system to spin another few rounds, uh, which I at the time had underestimated. So I think there are always two things, you know, having the right framework and the right paradigm to understand what goes on and being exactly right in, 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 in timing this. Uh, well, I, I don't think in my career as an investor I've done badly. So, uh, you know, I, I don't think I have cleaned up, as you phrased it. But, but I, I, I think I think I think I've done I've got, I've got a lot of things right as well. But some some things I didn't get right. But if you see at it, uh, if you look at it, we don't know exactly when things change and when um, your certain effects come through. And even in the prognosis I give you here, you know, my expectation is we will go through an extended period of very low inflation. Uh, we will go through more economic difficulties next year. We will get, see more bank problems next year, the next two years. And then we will see uh, even more aggressive policy than we've seen so far. You know, ultimately, I think uh, policymakers will become even more aggressive. And then there will be a point in which, uh, uh, you know, I think uh, you should probably sell government bonds and, you know, and, and I think gold will go, you know, even higher than it, than it, than it already is. I could be wrong on those, but, uh, and, and my timing could be off, but I think, I think we need to distinguish between sort of these theories and the exact timing of a trade, you know. But, but I think you're right, the, the question is not wrong and I, I tend to make money out of it, on it, yeah. Does it answer your question? I'm not quite sure if I answered your question. Does it even give you an edge? Having the right theory, I think at least gives you an edge. Yes, I think it does. Yeah, I think I think it should. I I do think it does. Yeah, absolutely, that's, absolutely. That's, that's Bob, <coughs> it's possible to um, it's possible to know the theory of hang gliding and yet not care to engage in it. <laughs> and I don't want to alarm the audience, but the uh, Majesty of the Queen today, I'm um, officially named QE3. That's how to so something rather large being launched down there. It was already launched, but. Uh, she said it could have his name, which was already printed on it. Um, more important point, uh, of course, when when um, when people take out loans for money that no one ever saved, like by way of credit, um, I've followed the Austrian uh, analysis for many years, and I don't see much wrong with it. Um, uh, plainly, there's trouble; the money hasn't been saved. However, for a while until people catch up, and some of them can't, including people on fixed incomes or those using their savings in old age, there is such a thing as forced saving. I mean, the, the, in effect, the purchasing power is transferred from um, people who would have used their money in the future, or even using it now, and is used by the, um, those who are taking out credit. So to some extent, there are real, real savings. The, the resources are plainly purchased by those who have money and put into things. Now we know, if it could be simply transferred, I mean, if we simply tax people and gave them money, that would be an alarm. Ill they do it anyway. But the point is, it's better if it's hidden. If it's hidden in the great mystery of banking, you don't see that the money is being taken from the pensioners and the old people and given to those starting their office office blocks or whatever it might be. But if it could be simply transferred, there might be something to it. However, the Austrians point out that the interest rate that does the work, you set the interest rate such a demand at that interest rate is such that you can only meet it by supplying more money. And so the money that's, that's supplied must eventually set up a, a chain reaction that leads back to having to jack up the interest rate because the 
the currency depreciates on the foreign markets, the pound has to be saved, or inflation has to be choked off, or something. So at that, that point we get, as you pointed out, we get the swing, we find out that the projects cannot be completed, the costs are rising of the, the assets to build the office block, let's say. Um, the future prices should look so good because office space is going up and up and up, suddenly it tapers down. So we find that things aren't even worth completing. I mean, in Las Vegas, I believe they were bulldozing new buildings. <laughs> they couldn't. It was cheaper that way than let them lie there and pay the local rates, for example. So um, it's just, just a small point that you can get some kind of, for a while, full saving, but not enough to justify all the projects that have been started, which cannot be brought to completion. Hmm. Once the effect of the money entry the system goes into costs and eventually means a return to a, a proper interest rate, hmm. or even higher than the natural rate would have been. Yeah, I think I think I think that I mean the point is correct. I mean I do think that I think the point about forced savings is I think is is uh, is overestimated because I mean the way I understand the forced saving theory is what what you would rely on is that you know the people who benefit from the extra money creation have a different savings behavior than uh, and a bit different uh, 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 yeah consumption behavior. And, 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 and therefore they will you know they, they benefit from the from the from the monetary inflation and then they save more and by, by that way you encourage saving as well is that, is, that, is, that, is, that, is that correct well that's the kind of Keynesian one isn't it whereby it pays for itself eventually the economy is booming so much the the, 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 the real savings yeah 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 take up the slack and, and you've justified the spending mm. so it's in this yeah I don't buy that no 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 neither do I neither, neither do I no 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 exactly yeah so I cannot just, I mean, I just want to add one point to your question because, you know, I just want to make sure that I did, didn't give an, uh, an incorrect example because I said, you know, in a way you could have, and I know for a fact people had doubts about the paper money system in 1979 and then Volcker came along and, and in a way saved, didn't save the system but gave it uh, more time by pushing the economy through the 1980s recession. Uh, I just want to make very sure that I, I, I'm very clear on this. I think this is almost impossible today. I think this will not happen. Yeah, no, this, this will not happen today. Yeah, and, and that's why coming back to the point of speculation, I'm not speculating my money on, on the fact that that can save the system again. And the simple reason is the following. In 1979, the entire debt of the US government was $870 billion. I mean, today, the budget deficit is larger than that. I mean, last year's budget deficit was $1.3 trillion. Uh, the forecast by the U.S. Budget Office is that even at uh, 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 the, the, the U.S. government forecast, or the Congressional Budget Office forecasts um, uh, growth for the next 10 years in the U.S. economy between 2 and 4%, uh, and a return of the un uh, 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 an un a receding unemployment rate back to 5.5%. And Despite this rosy outlook, they're still forecasting on average $600 billion deficit every year on average for the next 10 years. So what I'm saying is like today, uh, Paul Volcker coming along and st stepping on the brakes and, and stopping the money creation is almost, uh, almost impossible. So I think in that sense, the speculation against this happening is today more sensible. Uh, David and then John. Da uh, David first. In uh, let that immediate oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Will you okay. be investing accordingly? Personally, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. No, now, now that I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, uh, I'm no longer employed by by a city firm, so I have to look after my own money, and I obviously invested uh, along the lines of what I described to you today. Yes, David. Yeah, I mean, it's really a follow on from what you just said. Uh, there's a lot in in the manuscripts and in your talk about the uh, the uh, erroneous use by the government of the printing of money and artificially low interest rates in order to achieve certain policy objectives, of, whether it be stability or a boom or avoiding a recession. You didn't say much about the role that's played in all of this by government spending and the need for the government to raise money to pay for its spending. I was wondering how that factors in to your predictions, because it might be said that well, a third route uh, for governments uh, is well, a, a third end game, uh, as opposed to the two which you put forward, I think, which are one, a complete monetary collapse uh, before an organic move to a gold standard, 
or two a move to a gold standard of four and collapse, isn't the third possibility that governments hugely rein in spending? If they do hugely rein in spending, then that presumably allows or might allow something similar to what was done by the Fed in 1981. Now, what are you ruling that out simply on political grounds that you don't think that it would be possible for a government, major governments, to cut spending to the to the degree necessary, or is there some economic analysis that says that that won't work? Uh, I think that conceptually they, uh, there is no reason why this couldn't happen. So I think the short answer is it's, 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 it's an assessment of the political you know, situation and the, the political possibilities. You know, could we imagine, you could imagine a point where, I mean, just hypothetically, you know, we could imagine a point where the policy establishment would say, okay, we, you know, we got this wrong, there's too much money in the system, the system is dislocated, you know, banks are allowed to go under, uh, you know, we 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 uh, we stop printing more money. I mean, I don't think they would even have to contract the money supply. They would just have to stop trying to um, uh, expand it further. You know, you just just keep it fixed. You know, just just don't add to it. Which, in a way, I think is what what we're seeing right now because the banks can't expand anymore, and the Fed has massively expanded to avoid the correction in the system, uh, and so have other central banks. But but they're not aggressively expanding the system further right now, and that's why I think the economy feels so wobbly and 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 so uncertain. But 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 if indeed if they make a meaningful uh, commitment to not reflate the system again and allow the uh, and then uh, the, the system, as I said, wants to delever. If they allow the system to shrink, that would mean obviously a, a period of deflationary <coughs> correction, a severe recession, you know, bank failures, and so forth. And then they could say, okay, then we start for a new. And and I think you're right in that environment. Uh, obviously, without printing more money, the Fed would lose uh, this uh, extra source of revenue. Um, and and the, and the government had to have to save uh, uh, dramatically. Uh, I, I don't think politically right now it's feasible uh, because as I, as I just said, you know, even in an, in, a, in a scenario with economic growth, uh, right now the forecast is for budget deficits as far as you can see. If you have if you go through a really severe recession and a contraction of the economy uh, and a period of deflation, um, uh, I think government expenditure is going to going to expand even more and revenue is going to collapse even further. So right now, you know, the fiscal situation is such that even on a, in a very positive economic outlook, they continue to run, you know, massive deficits. Um, you know, if you look at some of the forecasts, for example, it's very interesting. You know, right now the U.S. government's number one source of income is uh, individual income tax, which is about a trillion dollars every year. The forecast right now is that in 10 years' time they can double that. And, and take more than $2 trillion every year. Uh, now, t the last 10 years, they didn't manage to raise it at all. I mean, it was, was $1 trillion for the last 10 years. So the forecast is they can double it for the next 10 years. It's very unlikely to happen. But now imagine you push the economy through a period of you know, uh, correction and uh, allow this cleansing of the dislocations to occur, which I think would be the right strategy. It's, it's very, very painful, but at least it would, would you know, sort of uh, get the problems out of the way. Right now, we're just simply not facing the problems. Um, uh, but but I think politically, it's very difficult to do. So uh, uh, I, I, mean, I think you look at the, the statistics right now show that I think in the US, 47% uh, of Americans over 18 don't pay any income tax. And, and then that's, that's, uh, so it's already the situation is already fairly dire. So for the, for the government to come out and, and cut back their spending so much, um, it is feasible conceptually. Yes, it could occur, but I think I think I think politically it's very unlikely. We don't see any signs that policy is going in that direction. But I also say that if they stop printing money and running deficits, they may as well go back to a gold standard, right? I mean, if they stop printing money, you know, then the advantage of the elastic money system, the paper money system, was indeed to to provide that extra money, and in situations like this one. To print money. I mean, that's why I think that's why the net, that is the natural response. That that that's what the system is designed for, and I think the the fault in the system is that over time it will create imbalances on a scale that they will not manage to reflate the system again. And that's where we are. Can I ask a short follow up? Yes, certainly. Do you have any sense of what degree of cutback in government activity and spending would be required to return us to what is a 
as you put it, equivalent to a gold standard system, mm. even though it wouldn't be one in name. How much, what percentage or proportion of government spending here in the States would have to be cut back to get us back to a system where, as you say, the system is claimed as long as it's 10%, 30%, 50%? Do you have any sense of it at all? Uh, I know. I mean, I, I didn't. I didn't run the uh, uh, short answer, David. Is I, I don't know, but I, I think it would be more than fifty percent. More than fifty percent. More than fifty percent. That that would be my. Half of what the government. Oh yeah. It, it's, 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 yeah. I think that's my assessment. Uh, do you, are you spent, John? Do you want to come back? Yeah. You do. Uh, well, well, you and then Bob afterwards. Uh, quickly on that point. Um, at any time, they could simply declare a gold standard. At the, at the current market level, uh, uh, could they not just declare that we're now back on the gold standards, and then they'd have to adjust their uh, their financial dealings, the government uh, accordingly. I mean, it's, it's not a question of that. I, 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 I quite understand this. You've got to cut back to a certain extent before you can go back on the gold standards. You can simply say we're on it now. Now, what do we have to do? Yeah, I mean, you, you, you could do that. I think, if I understand your question correctly, David, it's simply because if, if uh, uh, the uh, part of the government funding over, over time will be through ongoing inflation and, and to, you know, obviously ongoing inflation helps fund the government and, and, and that, that part of government funding would obviously be left out. I mean, you move people into higher tax brackets. You, you, you I mean, you, you can place obviously your bonds with the central bank, and uh, you know there, there, there are various ways in which the government yeah, benefits. I, I mean, what I meant was, if the government stopped printing money in any shape or form, then how much spending would have to be cut for it to, I suppose, balance its books? Well, I mean, in in, in a way, I think. You see, I think I think we're dealing here with two different things, which is one is obviously you know, but the budget deficit and or your government spending, and then and then the monetary constitution. Now, first of all, in terms of government spending, I mean, if if if, if the government raises the tax revenue, they, um, they 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 can can obviously spend, and if they run a bigger deficit, if they find private savers who, you know, buy these bonds, I you know you could. You could could make the case that you could even run a budget deficit, you know, in a gold standard. I think it will be much more limited because, you know, obviously one of the reasons that people think governments cannot default on their debt is because they theoretically can print the money, and if that's gone, uh, yeah, that 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 should affect it. Although I think that's a very weak reason to buy a government bond because you would get hurt on inflation. But um, uh, so I think it's two different questions. I mean, I've, 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 I'm not quite sure if, you know, I think there can be very different outcomes for you know, the size of the government or the role of the government or the size of budget deficits or government spending in, in the gold standard or without it. All I'm saying right now, the fact that there's so much debt uh, around that is being supported by artificially low interest rates. I think that's the key point. You know, the, 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 the interest rates artificially kept low and that allows much more credit creation it allows many of these assets to be you know carried that are not being supported by private savings and that includes the debt of the government and in this situation where it's the government debt that is expanding most rapidly you know if you if you stop the flow of money you know it's the government that also gets hurt uh, and 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 i think that's a political you know uh, uh, problem so that's the connection between the monetary system and the budget deficit is simply at the times like these when they are uh, the government is always expanding, not only in, in recessions, but then even more rapidly. That is, is, is all this budget deficit or the government debt needs to be carried by voluntary savings and, and cannot be supported by uh, artificially low interest rates. Bob? Um, to what extent does the government have, have anything to do with a return to the use of gold as money, even if you call it the gold standard? I don't like the gold standard because it sounds like the government has to make a promise to try and do something in the circumstances, given its other responsibilities and duties. It might not be that easy. We may have to do value, we may have to blah, 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 you know, the rest. In other words, there's no difficulty in using gold as money. But they want to have something that they can um, <clears throat> adjust around or default upon occasionally or um, revalue gold, because they, what they really want to do is to increase the money stock or dilute it by adding to it. Um, so I don't care for governments going back on the gold standard. I, if they simply announce that gold is a certain weight of, I mean, money is, a pound is a certain weight of gold, and that's it. 
Yeah. We don't have to do anything about it. That's what it, it is. Exactly. Now, if that's the case, then commercial banks can, can uh, exactly. mine and mint, or at least mint the stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. But I don't like the idea that it's a government uh, responsibility. No, no, exactly. I mean, I think I think I fully agree with you. I think I think in a perfect world, we, you would have the government completely out of money, and that means even providing you know money on a gold standard. They don't need to do it really. Yeah. They must do something. Yeah. <laughs> they, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Purposes. Uh, exactly right. It's, it's just uh, probably difficult to see, I mean, exactly how this would come about. But I mean, could you envision a scenario in which, um, you know, sort of. Uh, uh, people would, in, in, a, in a time of a monetary breakdown, would begin to voluntarily use gold, and then suddenly there would be, I don't know, uh, banks or you know, gold depositors, you know, gold uh, uh, companies that that store gold and and can transact in gold. Maybe sort of you could almost imagine uh, a, an alternative financial system oh, sort of pop up, up. But it, it would be suppressed immediately, and all yeah, the gold would be confiscated yeah. for the good of the public. Judith? Uh, yes. Uh, when will your book be Oh, I wish, uh, th th that's a very good question. I don't know. It's the short answer. I've, I've just finished sort of, uh, or I'm just in the process of polishing off my, my, my sort of final draft for the manuscript. So I don't even have a publisher yet. Um, uh, I, I went about it in a very strange way because it's the first book I've, I've ever written. As I said, I worked previously in financial markets. I never wrote a book before. So uh, when I decided to do it about a year ago, I, uh, I uh, just sat down and started writing because I wouldn't know if it all would you know, fit together and, and, and make sense in the end. And, and, I, and I hope it does. And, uh, and I think I'm now at a stage where I think I'm, I'm ready to approach publishers and, and agents. So, but I've, I've, I've not done that yet even. I'm still working on my final manuscript. Um, I think so it won't be out before Christmas. I'm, I'm ready. <laughs> John? Early in your talk, <coughs> you, you asked the question, something like, why do governments uh, increase the money supply? Uh, this reminded me of the old joke, you know, why do dogs lick their testicles? To which the answer is, because they can. Uh, uh, you, you, you said in, at that early stage of the talk, well, because, uh, you know, they think they can do good things. But, uh, you know, later on, you sort of made, you suggested some more sinister motivations, but uh, it seems to me that um, sinister motivations you know, uh, predominate, that they are always looking to buy votes by one method or another, even if it's only staving off the appearance of financial disaster so that they get through the next election. Uh, I mean, that sort of purpose of fiddling around with money supply exists, but there's also, and this is a question that I really like an answer on, because I've asked a few economists. Uh, mere seniorage and to what extent that exists. For instance, uh, houses in the area where I live about 50 years ago cost £1,000 each. Maybe houses aren't a very good example, but you know, but now they cost £750,000. That can't be all bubble. I don't think they're going to go back to £1,000. Uh, that it shows how, gives you some idea of how big that inflation is, and surely some of that is simply the government just thinking about we print this money, or not exactly print, you know, open market operations or whatever, and then we've got it and then we spend it. And it's just like I would do if I had uh, access to the printing press, uh, to, to the currency of the country, I would, uh, in the interest of everybody else, go into as much quantitative easing as I could possibly get away with. But in public spirit. Yeah. So, I mean, so, so, so really here's two, two questions. I mean, Really, is there, is there, how much would you say is the sort of the benign, and rather than really just them engaging in various political vote by shenanigans, shenanigans, but also, do you think you could put a percentage on seniorage? Uh, it's, um, well, I think the question, sort of, what motivates the government or the money producers. Uh, it's 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 a very difficult question. I think all the things you mentioned, I think, play a role. I mean, I think there is, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, a political uh, motivation behind this, obviously, or vote buying, as you said. Um, but I don't think. I mean, in our current monetary system, 
Um, I, I don't think it works simply like, you know, the year before the election, um, you know, the Prime Minister walking over to the central bank and asked them to, 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 to print more money. My, my understanding is there were times when that was practically the case, but 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 I don't think it works that, that, that easily anymore. Uh, and in terms of the way I presented it, I have to say that uh, I always try to give the opposition the benefit of the doubt here, and I did not want to present this in a way like this is all some, some big conspiracy theory. And it goes back to the question that Oliver had, where, you know, I worked in the financial industry and I met many economists who very strongly believe that this is this system is in the public interest and it's, 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 it's doing lots of good things. And, and the idea that we can create money uh, and that, that credit creation is being encouraged by money creation uh, is, is actually a, a marvelous thing. Uh, so I, I think, I think I, I, what I'm trying to do, and I hope I do this also in the book, is to uh, almost uh, think of my audience as being uh, coming, uh, approaching this from the mainstream angle. You know, I, I don't think I'm writing my book for people who already come with you know suspicious ideas about the government or the or you know an Austrian background or or even a libertarian background for that matter. Um, so I think in, in, and I think in real life I think it's a mixture of things. Um, uh, but uh, so I, I don't think a lot of that is not simply you know sort of a cold-hearted calculation. It's not. I, I don't think the people in in, in central banks or um, you know what I call it, what I call to the policy establishment. I don't think they're sitting there having read their Ludwig von Mises and knowing that this is all going to end in tears, but they still just want to win the next election. I don't think so. I think I think really many of these people think that this is just really what they have to do. And uh, uh, you know, I think for example. There's a whole literature out there about, you know, the mistakes that were made in the Great Depression. And they, they, these are almost all, as they relate to the Federal Reserve, they're all about how the Fed should have printed more money when the bubble burst. Very few people look at what the Fed contributed to creating the dislocations that led to the, to the correction in the first place. So I do think, uh, uh, I think it's a mixture. Yes, political interests come into play, but I, I, I don't think there's some mess of conspiracy theory out there uh, that they know the consequences completely. But, but could you put a figure on objective seniorage such that whatever their motives, it actually means that they're pr printing money which they effectively have for themselves to spend. Uh, it's their share. It's not that it's going out to a variety of other vested interests. For instance, when America increases the amount of dollars, it's taking money from everyone all around the world who are holding dollars. Uh, this is, you know, that's what you do when you can counterfeit money. Yeah. You know? yeah. Uh, that, I mean, I was just wondering if you had any idea of the sort of percentage. The percentage. Yeah, yeah, there must be a percentage, and it's objective, no, 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 irrespective no, no. of anybody's motive. Of that's how much they are benefiting by by increasing the money, yeah. uh, personally. What, 1%? Do they? Half a percent? Well, yeah, whatever, I don't know. I, mean, I, no, I, think, that, I think that, I mean, I, I would suggest 1% or half a percent or quarter percent. You know, people are, people think the system, what we've got, is there's nothing wrong with it. I think it's okay, you know, basically. But David, you wanted to talk? Yeah, uh, this is, I should probably go back and re-read the thesis, but um, a fundamental feature of, of what you've been saying, and indeed I think it's probably a fundamental feature of the Austrian analysis of, of the business cycle, is the notion of unsustainability, that when the government prints money, if it continues to do so, then this is creating inefficiencies which are unsustainable. And therefore, there must be a correction, irrespective of what the government wants or doesn't want. It must happen. Now, if I think in terms of other government-induced inefficiencies, let's suppose that the government subsidises the production of apples uh, at some vastly low price, now that could continue indefinitely. It would be damaging. We'd have too many apples, and the resources which would have got, which are going into the production of cheap apples, would have gone into something else, which would have more accurately reflected what people want. So we are less wealthy as a society. You could certainly conceive of that government-produced inefficiency continuing forever. It even stop until people say, "Well, hold on, though. this is stupid. We don't want so many apples, and we do want other stuff." Now, is it? What is it about government-produced 
dislocation of the monetary system that is different from government produced dislocation of, of the production of things like apples. That the government interference with the monetary system must inevitably at some point have to stop whatever they do. Whereas the same doesn't seem to be the case with things like apples. Uh, well, I think. Uh, that may just, I mean, yeah. Asking this question probably reflects my lack of understanding. Of no, the, no, no, no. Yeah, I, I think I think the the way I would try and answer that is is well, I'm not quite sure if if it's correct to think about these monetary phenomena and these monetary dislocations as inefficiencies because I, I, don't, I don't think I don't think necessarily that's 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 that's, that's, that's what they are. Um, I, I think that one of the differences I would see between what you described, if the market, if the, if the government distorts a certain market, uh, you know, by fixing prices or by uh, imposing regulations on it, um, I would argue that uh, well, there, there, there are lots of sort of unintended consequences that come of that, and, and those can certainly accumulate and, 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 and lead to further problems. But I think in, in the in the in the economic sphere or in terms of money. What happens if they expand money? They create uh, dislocations or they change uh, relative prices, as I said, and resource allocation. And the system, because the, the resource allocation is now out of line with consumer preferences, this, this uh, capital allocation is unstable. So the moment that the government stops it, this, this, this will certainly reverse. Yeah. Now this is also the, the case probably if they subsidize the production right. of apples, but they can just continue to go on and subsidize it. I, I mean, I guess, but... Well, uh, 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 sorry, just to come back, the key point in your answer was that the monetary uh, hens, is it hens come home to roost, I'm not sure what the metaphor is, at the point at which the government says no more. But the government, if it's subsidising unwanted apples, doesn't have to say no more. It can carry on doing it. It's a bad thing, but it can carry on doing it. Why is money different? What? Why is it that at some point the government has to say no more cheap credit, whereas it doesn't seem to have to say no more cheap apples? Now, I think what you can show with the monetary uh, dislocations, the government has to continue to inject money mm -hmm. and continue to inject more money to avoid the, res the, 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 I mean, the system to correct. So what it means, it has to push the system ever more into an ever so more dislocated uh, position. Practically, yes, yeah. So, so it's it cannot. It's not just one monetary injection, or just just you know, the system will go the other way if if this if the, if not more continuous flow of money uh, is being pushed into the economy. And indeed, over time, the flow of money will have to accelerate to avoid the correction of the system. So that's the key point. It's the accelerating point. And mm -hmm. I would need exactly. to sit down and understand why that. <coughs> Uh, there's quite a fierce dispute, even those who are, agree on the trade cycle theory, about um, free banking and fractional reserve. There are those who think we should have gold, yes, yes, we should have free banking, commercial banking, but the banks should be permitted, indeed encouraged, to have, a, have an elastic uh, monetary response to a sudden shift in the demand increase, that is the demand for money. Well, I don't think that's necessary. But there are those, it does sound rather Keynesian, but they pride themselves on it. They say it's not a good thing for prices to have to fall because people try and get a bigger store of, a bigger store of um, a person's power by saving money. I mean, you cannot, everyone cannot increase their money holdings because there's only so much money. But in the attempt to do so by um, spending less, for example, this will, this will dislocate the economy in a different kind of way. But, but no less. Therefore, it, uh, you, Austrians who believe in free banking should believe in fractional reserve so that banks can hand out uh, claims, claims to gold that, um, in, in a sense, are a bit bogus, but it's only for a while. And after the, uh, the needs of trade have um, changed because people have settled down again, um, it can be absorbed back in or something of that kind. They claim that this is, uh, this is okay and um, it should be permitted. Uh, what's your view on this? Uh, yeah, it's it's, um, um, it's it's a very interesting topic, of course, and I, and and I, and, I, and I read about it extensively and discussed it with David and and, and and other people because it's a very intricate problem. I, I have to admit that in in my in my book I don't focus on it too much simply because I think it, it, it can distract from the main oh. argument here. Right, so so it's a bit of a side argument, but it's a very fascinating one. Now, m my personal view on it is. 
uh, as, a, as a pure money monetary economist, I would agree with Ludwig von Mises and say that it's a, fractional reserve banking is a disturbance. In, a, in and of itself, it, it will lead to economic problems and dislocations. Now, uh, as a libertarian, you may say, well, still should be, uh, should be restricted or should be not just allow people to engage in it if they want to, if it's, if it's done openly, it's almost like consenting adults, you cannot you can stop anybody from doing it. And I, I have sympathy with that as well. And I do think, if you think it through, that I think in a free market, there would be fractional reserve banking. And yes, I do think it would be on the margin a destabilizing factor. But I don't, at the same time, I think it will probably in a free market be entire, very constrained because banks can, as they lower their, their reserve ratios, they do run that risk of running out of reserves. There will not be a central bank. There's no lend of last resort. There's nobody to step in and bail them out. So in, in, in that, and you can argue that if you really had a free market in banking and even in fractional reserve banking, which we never had, you know, governments very early on became very actively, as you know, very actively involved in supporting it or engaging in it themselves with their state their central banks. So if we really had a free market in banking, I, 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 maybe I think the market would find a way to deal with it. If that meant reserve ratios would be 100% or 70% or 80, I, I mean, I don't know. So the short answer is, I think it's a disturbance, but in a free market, we can live with it. I think the key problem is that it is government encouraged and government state supported, and that makes it definitely uh, a, a massive disturbance. Anyone else wants to speak? Oh, well, with that, I must thank you again. Once again, yeah, thanks for so a wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you.